Skal jeg også få gøre det? Kan det gøre det? Ja, så da har vi også svage og godt ting jo. Kan jeg køre nu? Jeg kan sådan der. Jeg går ikke, jeg vil gøre sådan der. So my name. So I just said that in the Kyuga language, um, and so uh, the name she tried to pronounce, the name that's up there, Kahantakeru, that's uh, my that's Mohawk, that's in the Mohawk language. I just said um, in Kyuga, Kaintakeru, that's um, in the Kyuga language, but it's the same name, it's the same word. Um, and on a dog, you'd say Kahantakeru, um, just to if if people here have never heard. Uh, the language, any of the Six Nations languages, um, just an example of um, what what they might sound like and how similar they are. Uh, so, as she mentioned, uh, um, the uh, ecotourism, ecotourism coordinator at Guyana say, um, and uh, I guess the 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 theme, culture, tourism, and storytelling at Guyana say it's. Uh, been a like she said. I started in 2017. My background is in ecology, but uh, the reason why they asked me to um, take on the role of ecotourism coordinator is because of uh, my ecological background, but as, as well as my cultural background. I grew up in Six Nations and uh, attending ceremonies and, and hearing the language, um, and so they they I had both those. Uh, Backgrounds, and they asked me to take over uh, because they, they started that initiative of of the longhouse. Um, so basically, the structure of Guyana say is through grade. Um, Aramontour is is sort of um, because we're under grade as an umbrella company. Uh, Aramontour sort of represents us through grade, um, and she. Uh, sort of takes her orders and passes those down to Carol Smith, who is our operations manager, and Carol passes those down to me. Uh, I brought with me today our, our uh, interpreter, Dexter Jimerson. Uh, he's, he was a, one of our summer students over the summer, and <laughs> uh, he, we hired him back. We liked him so much, we brought him back uh, just before the holidays as, as one of our interpreters um, to help me out. So our mission, uh, we had a, a different uh, mission statement before I, I kind of messed around with this a little bit and and added it, added to it and tried to decide what it should be because uh, um, defining exactly what we're what we're trying to do is um, difficult sometimes because um, there are other long houses. Crawford Lake is an example in Milton. Another one is Ganendagan down in New York State. Uh, Skanat Boat in London. Um, as far as I know, we're one of the only ones, or one of the few, that's on located on the reserve and um, totally run by the the people of the community. Um, other the other ones um, might not be built on reserves, but they all have some sort of input from from the communities. But uh, this one is totally our, our own. Um, another one I didn't mention was um, Kanada Kanada Village in Brantford. Um, and so just an overview of our, our project. Like I included some data of our, um, to show the numbers and, and our catchment. Uh, University of Waterloo, the, your program, uh, you'll see some of your slides from, from last year in there, and that helped us out a lot. Um, what, a lot of what we do is we work with um, whoever is willing to work with us. Um, and because um, where a lot of our funding comes from uh, applying to, to grants and things like that because we are a not, not for profit organization. Um, and so we, we have a dual role. Originally, Guyana say started as a um, ecological restoration company, and we're still doing that. We work on um, large scale restoration projects, planting projects. Um, and in the past two, two years, but it, the original thought behind it started about four years ago was to build this longhouse and to sort of initiate some uh, tourism. Now I'm an ecotourism coordinator, but most of what I've been doing is cultural tourism. So there's two aspects to, to develop, the, cu the cultural and the e ecological tourism. 
So we've, this isn't all of our accomplishments, this is just a few um, that we've noted, like the, some of the part partnerships, Six Nations Tourism has been a major one. Um, we sort of have a thing with the Brantford um, uh, Cultural Center and, and Six Nations Tourism and, and Guyana say we sort of package our tours as, a, as an attraction for, for people when they come to visit our community. And it, and it sort of gives um, them an option to, to see more than one feature when they come here and to be guided through that. Um, Six Nations Polytechnic is another one where um, we've, we've made some good, good connections where uh, a lot of the stuff that Rick has done over there in, in the IKC, Indigenous Knowledge Center, and um, we've gotten a lot of resources from them and, and there's been a lot of uh, working together within our, within our community, within our, our people. Uh, Crawford Lake is another one. Um, so uh, they've been really open and working with us and, and sharing information on, on some of the, their experiences and, and maintaining a, a longhouse. And that's, those are just some numbers that we had. So the Guyana say itself, 657 visitors um, April to December. The longhouse just last year in its first, first year, uh, August to December. Uh, so that wasn't even the beginning part of the summer, 423 visitors. Uh, impact on the community, so uh, what we have, one of the reasons why the Longhouse was built was for um, a space for people to come in and uh, when they're having struggles of identity because it, it's uh, our sort of result of colonization is uh, we have people, um, indigenous people or First Nations or Haudenosaunee people who um, weren't brought up with their culture the way I was and so um, they're there's a tendency sometimes for things like um, what they call lateral violence to occur within a community where um, what they say hurt people hurt people. And so you can have people who are brought up without the culture and, and they might be um, sort of put down for that um, by people who were. That's, that's a thing that happens, unfortunately. And so we're trying to create a space where those people can come and, and they can learn and they can take back what they what they need from from our culture. and. Um, that's been sort of my job is taking what I know and about the history, the recorded history and the oral tradition, the oral information from, from the old people and just from what I've learned throughout my life um, and to share that with them as best as I can. And for those who have retained their cultural identity, like people like myself or uh, people in my family and, and people in, that I know, um, a lot of them, they, there's parts of the culture that are missing. So they might have the language and they might have the ceremonial culture, but things like the material culture, how we utilize the land and, and plants, a lot of that has been lost in Six Nations because we've been co um, colonized for so long. So this is our sort of our site layout. Um, and we call our, our site Kahiwakta and Mohawk. Kahiwakta is how you pronounce that. And that means by the river. So you see the Grand River um, just sort of borders our site. Um, and by the road, by the Highway 54 is our longhouse, um, our main building and greenhouse for our uh, growing operations happen. And um, the, the longhouse itself, uh, what we call Ganusa Owe. So in, in our language, we call it Ganoses. The root word Ganusa means house. Gano uh, says means it's it's some that says on the end means it's it's long or or even stretched. So it's a long house. It's a literal translation. But gano sa onwe, we refer to ourselves as ongwe honwe. We're real people or original people, and so they refer to this building as gano sa onwe, the original house or the real house. Um, those are just the numbers on here, the length and width and height, uh, the materials that it's made from. So cedar probably most likely wasn't used historically, um, but we know that cedar is very rot resistant and we can order the right size logs that we want it for it and that's why it's, you, we used cedar <laughs> and it smells nice too. But the bark is all hardwood bark and it's all um, uh, harvested and, and processed and, and it's not, um, you know, it's, it's as close as we can get. Um, using modern material and natural material to something that um, you might have seen in the 17th, 17th century. 
So these are just some images of the inside. When we have all three fires going, you see on the left um, the, the smoke line that, that forms. Um, so, you know, architecture, you know, I, I just figured I'd throw that, in, throw that in there because it might um, be sort of uh, an inspiration um, because the, the height of the ceiling draws the smoke up closer to the, to the upper uh, rafters and, and keeps it from forming it, um, collecting at the bottom. And a lot of it has to do with what you do with the doors, how much air is flowing through, I've, I've discovered, and what's going on with the smoke holes. We have smoke hole covers, and if they're angled a certain way, it can bring the air in or it can draw it out. So there's a lot of uh, um, messing around and trying to figure out how it works because growing up, I never, I had never vis visited a thing like this. I've, I'd heard about them growing up. This is how we used to live. I've seen depictions, drawings. But uh, myself, growing up, I never had been in something like this. So. That knowledge is gone. We don't know how they kept smoke up there. Or, you know, and when we recreate this, we see it. And when I speak this to uh, my, my father, who um, he con he's one of the people who conduct ceremonies in Six Nations, and some of the other guys, they, I make these um, little, they're for me, they're discoveries, but they're already discovered at one time by our ancestors. But I noticed things and I mentioned them, and they, sometimes they connect it to our ceremonies and our culture. So uh, this is what I had showed on, on the map, the turtle garden and the pavilion that I um, were working with, with the university here, uh, with um, John and, and Paul who have uh, worked closely with me and, and Carol at Guyana City in designing this. Um, that's basically the, what we're going to have on our site. And it's, we've had a few, um, a few setbacks, but we're, we're working towards it and uh, we're hoping to have it running, up and running um, as soon as possible. Um, right now we have the Grand River Arts Program, which is sort of a, a program that, that was developed by um, Evlisa Genova, I believe is her last name. Uh, she works for the Chiefs of Ontario and, and she does this uh, Grand River Arts Program as sort of a side project and with Toby Williams from Six Nations. And uh, so they bring Six Nations kids and they, they do art with them, art programs, um, every other Saturday. Um, and the Turtle Garden that entire square area takes up about 17,000 square feet, so that's, that's a sizable garden we're going to be building there. And we're going to have a um, sort of a, a gazebo in the middle of it made from uh, cedar poles and, and uh, some sort of um, um, possibly a bark roof as well to match the longhouse. Um, what I do, this, I'm not going to go through each bullet. <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> but just to give you an idea uh, of what I do, um, it's, it can be one thing, it, it can be, we can be sitting in a longhouse making uh, what they call double ball or ding ball sticks out of dogwood um, for games that we're going to do in the future with tours or we can be writing reports or applying for funding or guiding a tour, it's, it's something different all the time, so it's, uh, it's never a dull moment. <laughs> so hopefully these will work. This is uh, Isle Thomas Odatronyanita Elementary School from Six Nations. So they teach Cayuga at their school. And uh, here we are. This is just a couple of quick three second uh, clips. We brought them in and we dance with them. It works. Uh, that's, that's their dancing gadatro, the gadatro that's uh, standing quiver dance. Um, and this is something that these kids, have, I don't think they have ever experienced. So this is the first time they've actually got to experience something in a setting like this where they get to dance their, their ceremonial songs. And um, This is another one, this is Delaware skin dance there, that we were dancing with them. And this is a, a, a dance we adopted from the Delaware people who, who are a different, um, uh, culturally different from us and linguistically different from us. but. Uh, we adopted this, this ceremony from them at some point throughout, throughout our, our history with them. Oop. I'm going to go back. <laughs> so they really enjoyed themselves that day. Um, and that's sort of what, what, we were, what we're all about is 
uh, bringing these kids here and, and tourists, visitors, and showing them something that, and letting them experience something that they, they won't see at Crawford Lake. Nothing against Crawford Lake, but uh, when they come to Six Nations, they can experience something a little, a little different. And it's not totally historically accurate. You can see the benches in there. And, um, like I said, we got modern materials on there, but where the authenticity comes is, is from uh, the community and, and our teachings. This is just some more shots. Um, this is on the left, they're playing hoop and darts. So their teacher uh, is rolling a hoop along the ground, and the kids are throwing the spears at it. They love that game. That's another game that um, isn't really played too much in our community anymore. Um, I haven't seen it growing up, but uh, the older people talk about playing it when they were young. So it's a place where we can bring back these, these games that have sort of fall, have fallen out of common use, and we can bring them back and, and show the kids how it's done and how they're played. Um, and then on the right is when we were practicing their ceremonial songs that we do in our um, modern longhouse ceremonies that they got to practice them in this, this new setting, this different setting, this, this old older type of setting with the actual fire going and things like that. This is a, a high school group, Hagersville High School. There's um, kids were here in the ninth grade. Some of them are from Six Nations. Some of them are from outside the community in uh, the surrounding towns. And I kind of got this photo bond there and the guy in the lower left. <laughs> He's from Six Nations and he, I didn't even know he did that until afterwards. <laughs> But they came there and they wanted some, some teachings about the longhouse and about Haudenosaunee culture. And they ate their lunch there, lunch there in the longhouse, and it was just a set, different kind of setting than most of them had ever experienced. That's what we're trying to provide. These are some donations that we received. Um, so Sue Hill, who spoke this morning, she donated the, um, the furs that were being, um, they were just in storage over at Western University of Western in London. Um, they were just in storage, and she offered to have, have them tripped over to us, and we, we gladly accepted them. Um, on the left is a former summer student, Lindsay Miller. She donated that. Um, she's studying at uh, the Syracuse University in, in uh, New York State, and she came back for a visit, and she dropped that off and, uh, for us to use on our displays, the, the Gunstock War Club you see up there in the upper left. And this canoe here is interesting. This was uh, a friend of mine from Delhi. I went to college with him and his dad had this canoe given to his um, his wife's grand grandfather in the um, I think it was 1920s he, made, he brokered a deal of um, the tobacco farms in Delhi where they um, gave tobacco to they said six nations and, and um, the, the people there provided them with this with this canoe and it's been in the family ever since and he offered to return it um, to our community but when I went to look at it it's it's authentic it's got the, the pitch um, uh, resin um, covering the, the holes and seams and it has on the right you see the um, spruce root lashings on, on the ends um, and so it's, it's, a, it's the real thing, it's the real deal and uh, he's uh, offered to uh, give that to us to, for as part of our display. This is a group of visitors so the friendships and friendships and visitors that we've had, these guys were down for ceremonies they're from uh, uh, Allegheny, New York, or near the town of Salamanca. Um, they were visiting for uh, ceremonies, and they had heard about Longhouse, and they heard that I worked there. Um, and so they asked if they could come in and take some pictures, and so I, I gladly brought them over and, and showed them around and t hung out with them, and um, we kind of had a good time. Uh, these guys um, are from... Uh, the 40 Year Friendship Center. Um, the guy on the far right, Gary Parker, I, I've known him uh, my whole life. But uh, they have a, sort of a men's group and they wanted to breed corn. And so they came to Six Nations and I uh, um, offered them the, to use the space as a place where they could come and breed corn in a, in a setting that they haven't ever breeded corn in. Um, these are some international visitors that we had, just some of them. So on the left are a group from, uh, I think they're from Wales in the UK. And they were looking for uh, First Nations experience that they could come and visit. And they were visiting, um, they are on an exchange program in Simcoe. And so they came up and I gave them a tour and we talked about some of the, the cultural, um, you know, some, some of the Haudenosaunee culture in Six Nations. And on the right, that was actually just on, on Monday, um, 
so the girl in the center, she's from Kenya, and they kind of just popped in on us, and we gave them a, showed them the longhouse, and and uh, gave them a little tour. Um, some of the other connections we made, and um, on the left, that's at the uh, Sustainable Archaeology Lab in London. Um, Neil Ferris gave us a tour of his facilities and his 3D printing program of artifacts, and we got to hold real artifacts and. Like growing up in Six Nations as a Haudenosaunee person, I hadn't actually held a, an artifact of a Haudenosaunee until I was um, almost 30. So just a few years ago, I actually got to hold something that was made by my ancestors. And so a lot of kids in the community don't actually get to experience that. And that's what we're trying to provide. So we're working on getting artifacts donated from uh, the Sustainable Archaeology Lab and other sources for us to put on display for people, our people, the community, to come and see and touch and hold and something that their ancestors have, have made and held. And on the right, I went to a conference in last April, um, and it was sort of a gathering of indigenous youth. Um, Joey Mackinac, that's, that's the guy in the picture there, we made friends, he's from the Stony people, the Stony Nakota people in Alberta. And so we made connections uh, with people from, from across Canada, um, indigenous youth from across Canada. And, um, talked about some of the how we're trying to get our communities engaged and, and educate um, the community, the surrounding communities of, of our people, and so they're in the, they're in the same boat as us. So a few more images of uh, some visitors that we had on the left. Those people were from um, China and Japan. There was a environmental sustainability group from I think University of Guelph, and uh, on the right is the one of the mental health organizations in Six Nations came and they. They hung out there in the longhouse and asked a lot of questions, and we had a good time. So we're, we're offering this to visitors, non-native visitors, international tourists, and the community. We're trying to be accessible to everybody. This is uh, Nimasa. They're a group in Hamilton, downtown Hamilton. So these people, they're a daycare, and they sort of act as a, a community center. And these people don't get, off, get to leave the city too often, so they organize these trips, these outings, and... They came to the longhouse and they really loved it. They had a really good time. A lot of them are are indigenous, or they have indigenous indigenous ancestry, but they don't have that connection to the to the community anymore. So, um, for them to be able to come and experience this um, was was really special for them. And even to have the fire, um, you know, something I take for granted. Cause I live in the in in the country and I can make a fire whenever I want. But these people, they don't get to do that. So when they they got to make a fire, they wanted to make the fire themselves, and they were really excited for that. So. Um, we have a lot of fun. Some of the programming we do, this is the job readiness program here in Six Nations, and these people are preparing for uh, career changes or, or they're um, seeking careers or in, and seeking employment, and they're looking for skills. And what part of the requirement is they need cultural input, and so they, we do that through Guyana State. So this is when we went out and we collected uh, materials for starting fire, because in our community we have lost this knowledge of how to collect tinder and, and um, make fire from what's out there in the land. A lot of the people, they, they talk about it. We used to do this, we used to do that. But when you go to ask them how to do it, they don't know. So um, I pick up on these old skills and these what they call primitive technology. <laughs> it's pretty, uh, I wouldn't call it primitive. It took me three days to figure out how to make a fire from a, a, what was growing in a field. But it's all there, how to do it. And the women in here, they were really excited after, and they were going to go home and show their husbands how to make a fire. <laughs> this is the same group. Um, most of them had never braided corn in their lives. This is their culture, growing corn. Uh, some people refer to it as the three sisters. We refer to it as, as the um, the life sustainers. This is a really important to our culture. People don't realize, our own people don't realize how really how important it is. But here they get to braid the corn, learn how to pick the corn, how to recognize, you know, a lot of them had never even seen corn smut growing on the, on the corn cob. You know, it's a fungus that grows on corn. They'd never seen it because they'd never grown corn, but they lived in the community their whole life. So this is a chance for them to experience that. And the guy there, he, he made a really good, I think it was about a five foot long braid, maybe about 70 pounds at that point. It gets heavier and heavier the longer you make the braid. Here we are making cordage out of natural material. Um, dog bean, we use dog bean most of the time because it grows in the community. So I go and I collect these natural materials and I bring them back for people to 
experience making cordage. Um, so I think Opossinum cannabinum is the, the Latin name for this plant. Um, and so they've never experienced that. They, that knowledge is almost gone in our community. So there's no people that you can turn to to teach me how to make cordage out of a plant. They don't know. Even though the elders, most of them don't know. We also do events, uh, storytelling. Rare. This is coming up this month on the 19th, Family Day. If you're not busy, come on out. Learn about snow snake. This is one of our traditional games. Um, you can uh, pre-register, but uh, this is just something that I, we decided to do because um, you know there's people in our community who have never gotten to throw a snow snake because it's it's sort of these families that have had it have always had it, and it's in those families. But the other families who didn't retain that knowledge or that game, they they lost it, and so we can bring people, visitors like yourselves and people from the community to come and try it and to learn about it. And the Snow Snake Tournament, which is the, the people who still play it uh, competitively and who have retained it, that's for them. The weekend after, the 24th and 25th, for them to come and sign up and play for, they usually play for money. <laughs> so we provide a, a, a prize money and they have their own side bets, they, they lay down and they play this game. And, it gets real competitive. <laughs> um, there's another event we had was part of the Ontario um, Culture Days, uh, where they could community members could just drop in, and, and we had a story time at night with hot cocoa and uh, a little fire going. This is like I had mentioned before, the Grand River Arts Program, um, doing art with the, with youth and, and children from Six Nations. This is another invitation I made. This is with the University of Guelph. They're doing landscape ar architecture, and they, I just made this poster on, on paint. <laughs> but uh, theirs, were, theirs were a lot nicer. They made full-scale designs of our site, and they offered those to us to use to develop our site. And all their research and, and um, uh, methods to use were, were given to us to use. Uh, this, is, this might look familiar to the people coming here. At, uh, at this campus, this was me last last year working with the with the program to develop the um, the learning pavilion that we've been working on. This is uh, some of the, the stats that I talked about. So um, the indigenous plants tour that went on. There was a group from all over the world. They they're um, sort of horticulturalists and they're they're plant nerds and they want to know about plants. And so they did a big tour. Um, in Ontario and New York State. And so to, on the far left, we're the second one um, Indigenous Plants Tour. We got the highest excellent rating. So that was a bunch of um, groups that uh, facilitated this tour, and we were part of that. So um, we like to think that you know we're doing a good job in, in bringing the authenticity and, and bringing joy to people when they come to visit. These are some of the testimonials. I'm not going to make you read all that, <laughs> just to give you an idea. This is our own statistics from uh, Six Nations tourism from the summer tour season. You can see on the, on the far right where the feathers are there, 671 visitors throughout the summer uh, tour season. So that, that's really good. And it shows, even shows the, where the tours are coming from. You know, 46% are from, from within North America or, or Canada. And 33%, the second highest um, percentage is from Europe overseas. So this is information that was provided by University of Waterloo. Um, students and their research and the sort of, sort of shows our catchment area for possible uh, tours and they also included information. So like I said, we try to work with whoever we can um, to help us and, and to, to share knowledge and to sh exchange. And so this is um, when I you know, guided them through their research and, and what they were working on, they pro provided this to us and this is really helpful to us. Uh, so you see 34.5% 30, of Ontario elementary school students fall within our catchment. So we're, we're working towards um, accessing that, um, that um, sort of uh, that area and, and that um, demographic. Here's some of the challenges that we've had. Just the continued site development, like I said, everything depends on funding um, sources and facilitating programs. Uh, like I said, a lot of that, that big list of what I do that's just me doing all that. So when I'm running a program and I'm trying to take pictures at the same time of what's happening, it can get a little difficult and I'm trying to keep people engaged because, you know, um, 
it's not always easy. Like when I'm working with uh, Six Nations welding students, they're all a bunch of young guys. I got to keep them engaged because as soon as I stop, they, they're they're gone. They're, <laughs> they're not in the same room anymore. <laughs> so um, that Dexter's been a big help with that, having him around to, to facilitate some of the programming and tours. Um, and narrowing the scope, so I get people who grew up down the road from Six Nations coming in and not knowing that there are two distinct groups living in our community. We have the Haudenosaunee and we have the Anishinaabek people living in New Credit. These two language families, are, our languages are not related at all. And there's people who live their whole lives next door, ne never knew that. So that's part of the education, is educating people when they come there, visitors when they come there. Um, and the, because I sort of, when I see news and, you know, something have First Nations, oh, well, the natives, but they don't, a lot of people don't realize that within that term, the natives, like when you're doing your research with indigenous communities, you have to get right in and, and meet the people. Because when you're designing things, you know, um, I don't know what it is, but it doesn't matter where you go. Uh, what community you go to, you, you know what's legit and who's legit and what they're talking about and who the people are who are putting on a show for the tourists. And <laughs> um, so when when we do things at at our facility at Kayana say, we know that our community members are watching, and they're gonna know if we're, um, you know, feeding people a story or or telling something that sounds, uh, you know. That doesn't sound realistic or what they know as the culture. So we had to, uh, I think, when you're researching projects that you work on with indigenous communities, you want to make sure that it's authentic. It's authentic. It's what, what the people think and what they experience on a day to day basis. Because this is what um, we worked on is with um, Paul and, and John a lot was uh, uh, just making sure that what they, what they design, when people come there, they know that it's going to be a place where they can. Um, design lacrosse sticks and it's going to be a, something they know that whoever built it had that in mind they weren't just making it up uh, so yeah, that's part of the challenge and I get people coming here asking well how do you buy land here and, uh, how do you get married do you get married do you need to get married and, yeah we get married <laughs> yeah we, yeah there you go and then but then there's including the 17th century information on top of all that so it's navigating that historical timeline and navigating the culture and navigating all the information is difficult. Bridging, bridging history, oral history and written history can be a challenge. You know, because we have our own depiction of our, of our, of our own history, which often doesn't agree with what's written because we experienced, our people experienced it. And we still, we still carry those stories in our families. Um, that's that doesn't pertain to this, but some of the other stuff I've done. That's Sue there, and that's our our project we worked on together. So I, I make I make connections when I go to these different conferences and symposiums, and I, I do public speaking. I make connections with people. Uh, so um, the storytelling aspect, cultural preservation, traditional ecological knowledge. So these are some of the stories I got from. Uh, the IKC, Indigenous Knowledge Center. These are just snippets that I took. Um, so Skagedi lived on a hill, and the man-eater lived at the, bot at the foot of the hill. The man had a little kettle with a piece of chestnut. One day he scraped some, some of the chestnut into a kettle, and taking a stick, whipped the kettle until it, until it was the size he wanted, full of chestnut pudding. And so uh, the next one. There's a, the man is running away from a monster, having a premonition about what was, what was to come, and was told twice by old men along his path to seek help from the next old man, until he arrives at the third old man who agrees to help him. The old man was making a fishnet. This was of swamp milkweed fiber. And so um, there's two things in here. Chestnut, American chestnut, and swamp milkweed fiber, or swamp milkweed. These are two plants that people in our community still, they don't know how to identify because the chestnut blight came and wiped out all the chestnuts in the um, late 1800s and because we no longer have a close connection with the, with the ecology in a lot of cases because of because of the um, cultural assimilation and, and 
um, you know, we lose that, that connection to the land. It's still in our culture, it's still in our ceremonies, but the actual physical connection, how to identify the plants, you know, a lot of times is, is lost. But it's in our stories, it's in our culture. So this is, like I say, recorded in 1915 from Six Nations. Um, so right in the center of this picture is Six Nations Reserve, the little green postage stamp um, that she mentioned at the beginning. Largest tract of uh, uh, Carolinian forest in Canada right now. Uh, it's being reduced every day, year by year. I see more and more of it being reduced for our, as our population grows and, and as we seek economic um, uh, freedom and, and things like that. Um, how do the, all these things tie, these stories and these things tie into our culture? Uh, let me just skip to this. This is the American chestnut. So people in our community don't know what this is anymore. They don't know the significance of it. And um, so when, when I look for the word, how do you say chestnut in a language? Ohita is what I get in Cayuga. And I seen a, a conversation of people in the Mohawk language who are learning Mohawk language asking, how do you say chestnut? And I, I hear, Yakosadas uh, Osofkwa in Mohawk. That's a, Yagosadas is a horse. Osofkwa is a nut, horse nut. And they're referring to the horse chestnut tree, which, which isn't indigenous to our area. So that, you know, how do you say that, that word? Uh, after looking through some books and language, asking people, asking around what people knew, is how you say American chestnut. And because it's been out of our culture, out of the landscape for so long, it's, it's lost. And so we have people calling it, or thinking that it's horse chestnut. It's not indigenous to our area. This one, American chestnut, is the one that, that we know of. Omahagarna, it means white flowers. So the part of my work is as I research these things and the history, I learn these. I, I learn myself and I can pass that to the to the community. These are some pictures from the Chattahoochee National Park in Georgia. Just an example of how big these trees were, chestnut trees. And um, you know, if you can imagine, it wasn't just chestnuts that were this size, it was um, a variety of, of old growth hardwood species that, um, that were in, in the, on the landscape at one time. So after the chestnut blight moved through, this is what it looked like in the summer because it made up 30% of the canopy. So the tsako, we, we have a social dance, we, we still dance to this day, tsako wakya, pigeon dance. And it's the passenger pigeon, it's extinct. So, you know, that's, that's part of our culture that, that's lost now. You know, we used to eat the passenger pigeon, we used to harvest that. One of their, their staple foods of the passenger pigeon was, along with humans and other animals, was um, the American chestnut. And so these are things that, that I, I, I teach people in our community, that knowledge has been lost. Not lost or it's forgotten. Uh, some of the other things I did, so uh, the, the swamp milkweed is what the, the only word I can find for that is nunk. Nunk is what you call swamp milkweed, and I don't know what even know what that mean, what that means, how you translate it, but um, it's part of the um, the landscape. And what we say about these flowering plants and grasses, we call it in our language otwankronyo. And every time we give thanks, we, we mention otwankronyo, and that's the flowers and grasses because they're important to us. That's where our medicines are. And when we're in it, we see the, the flowers blooming, it makes you feel good, and that's a medicine in itself. So even if it's something that you don't pick and make into a medicine, the fact that it's there and it's growing, and you see it, you see the colors of the flowers, and you see the birds are flying around singing, and the butterflies are, are there in, in the field, you feel good, and they say that's medicine. that heals you, it makes your mind well. Every time we give thanks, this is what, this is what we talk about. It's part of our, our culture. And um, so, in that original story I showed you, he was making fishnets out of swamp milkweed. This is swamp milkweed. And so people in our community don't know how to, how to identify this plant. And if they did, they often don't know the, the use, the material use of it, or how it ties into our culture. Like I just mentioned, it's a flower. It attracts butterflies, 
And it makes you feel good when you see these things and you get that fragrance from the flower. It heals you. It's medicine. And this lady, I met this lady, um, Margaret, um, I'm not sure how to say her last name. <laughs> I met Bruchak, yeah. So she was doing research on the wampum belts of the Haudenosaunee and what she found after I did a similar talk like this and I mentioned the swamp milkweed and things like that, part of her research was um, she found that the wampum belts were strung together with swamp milkweed. And so everything that, you know, that I'm learning seems to always tie back into the culture, ties back into the material culture, into the ceremonial culture, into the longhouse, into our, our distant past of the Haudenosaunee. And so when she approached me after my talk, she, she, that's what she told me, is that it was swamp milkweed and I had some Indian hemp on hand that I also used to make cordage and I, and I provided her with that sample to take with her. And I, I, I was like, when you, don't you, haven't you ever been out to collect swamp milkweed and, and actually make the cordage out of it? And she said, no. <laughs> so I don't know if, like how you study wampum belts and you know, make that part of your, your career and not ever go out and actually collect the plant. And <laughs> But I was happy to be able to provide that to her. So these are in Six Nations. Uh, when we came from New York State, um, what they find in the, in the archaeological record is that we brought our lifestyle with us. Even though it was the um, late 1700s, early 1800s, we had access to uh, livestock and plows, but people, most people were still planting the three, the corn, beans, and squash mounds bone planting, and they were eating primarily uh, wild game. And where they hunted this was in the prairies, the grasslands, of the one Kron, you know, where, I, where I had already mentioned. This is how important these places were. This is where they hunted the deer that they used in their ceremonies and, and to feed themselves. And this is where they collected their medicine. And these were maintained with fire. So this sort of depicts where those areas were, where we had our hunting grounds in, in the Grand River after we came here from New York State. Um, the only ones who didn't do it in the center there were the Mohawks the, the, at the Mohawk Chapel. They were primarily eating um, pigs and chickens and um, planting and, and row crops at that time. But everyone else uh, was living a very similar lifestyle to their, their ancient ancestors in the 17th century. And um, that's sort of just a, a depiction of that, these uh, oak savannas and prairies where they would maintain with fire and use as hunting grounds and places to gather medicine. And we still hear about it in our culture. Kyunhehko, like I already mentioned. You know, I, people always ask me to talk about the three sisters, but when I ask the, some of the old people, they say, I never heard of three sisters. That's new. That's, that's made, someone made that up or they borrowed it from another culture. Um, and there's reasons why they say three sisters, like they understand why they might say that. but. Kionheko, I was told, are five life sustainers. Corn, beans, squash, tobacco, and the wild potato, ohonoda. It's not the potato you grow in a grocery you buy in a grocery store, it's uh, probably this, one of, one of two plants, this is one of them, Ipios americana, groundnut. Um, and so this grows wild as a vine and you can collect the tubers to eat as potatoes. And what uh, the research I did into this plant told me that people would take the rhizomes and plant them in future village sites because it takes two years for um, this plant to establish and to become a usable resource. So um, it's interesting when you, when you research some of this stuff and, and with the cultural information and you, you look into the, the actual plants and the actual material and physical nature of it, what you learn. Um, the other plant that might have been used for the the potato, wild potato, would have, would have been the um, Jerusalem artichoke flower, which is part of the uh, the sunflower family. But that uh, pretty much concludes uh, what I had to share. Thank you. Yama.